Hey guys, we don't own the rights to any of these songs, the words, or the videos, but let's sing together when the roll is called up yonder. sing here and we'll sing one more song this evening
tonight uh, through Facebook. Let's have a word of prayer. In the garden alone, one of my very favorite hymns of the faith, uh, my uncle Tom Coleman uh, used to sing that song when I was a little guy, and I can remember and hear him singing that in my head. And so let's pray together. Father God, we are thankful to come tonight, Lord, uh, through Facebook to come together in one spirit with one accord, looking, Lord, to sing songs to you, Lord, for your glory, and, Lord, that through us we might be a light to the rest of the world through uh, this technology that you have given us. Father, I pray tonight that you would use this study, that you would use uh, your word as always. We know that it won't return into us void, but, Lord, that it would further the kingdom. And, Father, we pray tonight that you would bless this service. In Jesus' name, everyone says amen. amen. This evening we're going to look in James chapter 5, James chapter 5, and when you find James chapter 5, I want you to go all the way down here and look at the, uh, it would be the 14th verse, the 14th verse, and so when you find that, if you would say uh, amen, James chapter 5 verse 14, and um, <clears throat> if you would, uh, would you grab my notes there? So they are off the table. I think I left my notes back there. Appreciate that. James chapter 5 and verse 14. Let's read this. Actually, let's back up to the 13th verse. The 13th verse. Thank you. The 13th verse says this. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It goes on here to say, in the prayer of faith, that is the title of our message tonight, the prayer of faith, uh, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Now this is a very familiar verse uh, in James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that you would bless the reading of your word, Lord, that you would use it tonight, Lord, to Help us to grow, Lord, to do all the things that you would want it to do for us tonight. Father, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. The prayer of faith. A faith prayer is one in harmony uh, that is able to discern the revealed will, will of God. Uh, when it's acted upon by the person praying, uh, there's a few things that we must know concerning uh, how to pray a true prayer of faith. And when we do this, we'll see as Elijah acted upon this uh, prayer, he was acting on the authority of the Lord. Uh, the people here, you're going to see in 1 Kings, uh, the specific verses that James is writing about. Now, it's interesting, James is writing about that because James, writing in a similar situation as us for different reasons, but the church has been scattered there at Jerusalem. James, uh, we believe the brother of Jesus, this James, uh, the, the leader of the Jerusalem council, James is now writing a, a simple love letter to the church, to the flock that God had entrusted him with. And he's writing to all these people scattered abroad. Isn't that so familiar and similar to our situation now? Though we're scattered abroad, their way was through letter. Our way is through the Internet. But James is writing this, and he uses Elijah as he was writing to the majority Jewish uh, people there, the Jewish Christians uh, from Jerusalem that he's writing to. And he's writing and he's using Elijah here to show the people that there was a time and God had used this faithful uh, prayer of faith 
And the people had been brought to their knees uh, to confess the Lord alone was God. And now Elijah uh, prays for the curse to be lifted. And so I want to look back here in 1 Kings. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And let's look at this Bible truth uh, from Elijah and what goes on there. Many of you know the story. Some of you may not. But I want to look at Elijah's prayer of faith and just how God used this and what James is writing about and how that uh, fits in with us today in dealing with what we're dealing with as a, uh, as a people and as a nation and as a world. And here uh, you'll see that James uh, had written about this story with Elijah and in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18. Let's look all the way down at the 36th verse, the 36th verse. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Now I want you to know, number one this evening, a prayer of faith comes by listening for the will of God, by listening for the will of God. You see that Elijah there says, I am thy servant and I have done all these things uh, at thy word. When you do something at the word of the Lord, you're doing it at his calling, at his insistence, uh, by his will. And so when you see that here, what we take from that and gather is that listening for the will of God is different than praying to God. They are two different things. A prayer of faith is praying that the will of God be done because it's something God has already revealed to you would be done. He said, now that sounds crazy, Pastor. Well, it's not so crazy. It's Bible. Look at 1 Kings 18, verse 1. Go all the way back to the first verse of this and see where Elijah gets this. He's listening for the will of God. He hears the will of God, and now he's praying that the will of God would be done. It says that it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. God's already told Elijah what he's going to do. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and I don't want you to think that I'm building myself up here, but when I'm looking out this uh, coronavirus, which causes the COVID-19, I'm looking at this and I'm telling you today that God's already told me what he's going to do. And you say, how can you know that, Pastor? Because it's in the book. Because the Bible, the revelation of the Bible is God's will. And so if we know our word, then we know what's going to happen. Uh, at the end of the book, we know we win. But even in our time now, I believe we can know what's going to happen because we know the will of God. See, prayer is talking to God, but listening means we've got to do something. Listening requires the Christian to be quiet, be still, and allow God to, to talk. There's my puppy Gideon. You see him? That's what happens on Facebook Live at home. He's, he's in here. And so he's white as a lamb. He's being my illustration. But you see God is being the absolute uh, authority here in Elijah's life. And so he's saying to him, hey, listen, you got to be quiet and hear me. Elijah hears him. He says, listen. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, and Elijah hears this, and Elijah knows. So now back in verse 36, it's no surprise to Elijah that when he uh, goes to the Lord and he says, Hey, I've done all these things at thy word, Elijah says, I've acted upon what you've already told me to do. Number one, uh, a prayer of faith comes by listening for the will of God. And I remember when I was a little boy, we would be on the bus Riding the whole Roy E. Holmes Elementary School, Wilmington, Ohio, and we would be on that bus and sitting in the in the bus, and you know you would come to the railroad tracks. Now I have not been on a bus in many years, and my kids don't ride the bus, so I don't know if they still do this. But back in the day, back in the '90s, we used to have put our fingers uh, up like this, like peace signs, at the bus stop, and that meant everybody's supposed to be quiet. Shh, and the bus driver would stop and put the stop sign out, and, and we would listen both ways for a train. Now, I'm telling you, world, that if we are to hear the will of God, we must stop in our tracks so we don't get hit by the train of the world that's coming fast and hitting us at high impact. We must stop and listen to hear the peace of God. Now, number two, 
uh, prayer of faith comes by showing the world the power of God. Now is a time, church, where we are going to have to speak up about the power of God. The Bible says there's a time to speak up or there's a time to be silent. Now is a time to speak, my friends. God is telling us that it's time to show the world who he truly is. We will obey and pray for the magistrates of this world. We will certainly do that for our president, for our governors. Uh, we will listen and we will hearken unto the rules and, and to the things they're trying to do to protect our nation. But what we need to do here is that our hearts will not fail us while we're doing it. We won't be faithless while we're waiting and obeying the rules and obeying what the governor and the president have asked us to do and the CDC. No, we won't allow that to cause us to fear. We'll use this as an opportunity to speak. Let me show you the context in the Bible here in 1 Kings 18.39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the the God. Now, why did they say that? Back up. Elijah has told God that he's acted upon his will. But in verse 37, he prays here. He says, hear me, O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. You see what happens is here is the people are shown the power of God, the might of God, the fire that comes down and licks up this trench. And now the people are saying, oh my goodness, he is the Lord, the one true God. We must, church, go in our prayer of faith, go about showing everyone else who our God is in this time of struggle, in this time of trial. We must show them so that they see what we know, that the Lord God is one and that he is one who he says that he is. Number three, true confession. There in that same verse that we just read, you see a true confession. These people have seen the power of God. They've been brought to their knees and now they have a true confession. Uh, the Bible told us back there in James that if we confess our faults uh, one to another, that we must do that first and then pray about it. And so here we understand some things. And back in the verse where it says that when the people saw it, they fell on their faces. Now, I'm not much into uh, saying that there are signs. Uh, Jesus says that you're looking for a sign. The sign has come. I rose from the dead. But I do believe this. There are things that happen in our culture, in our society, in our world that are uh, just that, signs of the time and signs of the age that we are in. And I'll just say it to you simply. This world has gone plumb crazy, has gone mad. Things that are bad according to the word of God and have been bad even morally throughout the times of history are now all of a sudden celebrated, looked at as good champion. And if you don't believe that, then they make you out like you're the crazy one. But I will say to you, and I'll say it live on Facebook for anyone to hear it, that the word of God has remained the same and always will remain the same, that the will of God is always the same. And God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And I'm telling you right now that I'm not saying that people who are dying or sick with this virus are, are feeling the, the wrath of God. But I am saying this, that sin has caused all pestilence, all virus, all disease. And God says he will avenge sin. He will take care of sin. Sin. He says, you can't do it. I will. So church, we must be the first ones to confess what we're doing wrong and invite holiness back into our churches. Now, you can argue with me about music. You can argue with me about style of dress. And we are all shifted in different places. And, and you can say what you want to say. And I'll not argue with you on preference. But what I will argue with you on is that the church must look like the church. It must look like God. And that the world, the outside influences, can't come into the church and make the church look like the world. No, the church needs to go into the world and have the world looking like the church. That is where we are mistaken today. We need to invite holiness back into our lives. We need to invite holiness back into our churches, not acting as if we are spiritual, as the Pharisees did, but truly being spiritual as the true worshipers that God seeks. You see, what happens in our world is we get so busy about things that don't really matter about the temporal that the eternal is sat down in the back somewhere and our prayers start to mirror those things that really don't matter. Let me give you some 
things here that might make a few people mad, but I want to be real clear today. I've lived in Dayton, Ohio for almost two years now, just a couple of months shy of two years. Since the time that we moved here, we have gone through a tornado that completely destroyed a couple of people in our church's homes. And, uh, we've done much work around the area and seen the destruction that, that caused. My own roof and uh, fence not severely damaged but had to be replaced. And, and seeing that destruction here uh, where we live in the North Dayton area. Since that time, there was a mass shooting at the Oregon District about six miles from my home. Since that time, we have seen so many different things in the world, and now this disease comes. And because of this disease, let me just say this to you, that the University of Dayton, my wife's uh, grad school alma mater, uh, which is about five minutes down the road from our house, and we were so excited. We'll be topping in the boys and UD and let's go and we can see a game and we're right here uh, close by number three in the nation and then all of a sudden the tournament's over. COVID closed it down. They said, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm saying this to you. Games are just games. And I feel for all those seniors and all those people that are missing out on things. But I want you to know that in the grand scheme of life, uh, this is my 20th high school anniversary, the 20 year reunion uh, of me graduating from high school. And in 2020, all my 2020 friends out there, uh, we were waiting until December 31st of, 2000, or of 1999 and uh, in 2000 as the, the clock turned, everybody was worried about Y2K and what would happen. Now, 20 years later, these seniors are worried that they're not going to have a graduation or they're not going to be able to, they're not able to finish their winter sports season or have a spring sports season. And all I'm saying to you is those prayers are warranted. We need to pray for their hearts, but those prayers that we are, are praying are praying amiss because the will of God doesn't strive with basketball games. The will of God doesn't strive with things that are temporal that don't truly matter. God saying that people are dying and going to hell because they've gotten this disease and they're afflicted and that a prayer of faith is praying that those people that we focus our attention in on what really matters right now. I see memes and I don't get on Facebook often but I see memes and people voting fun and, and doing things on there and people are arguing back and forth because somebody doesn't want to stay home, somebody wants to go out, and all I'm saying to you is stop it. Knock it off. We need to focus our prayers on the things that really matter, on the will of God, and what God's will is, is that willing that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We must focus. If you are a Christian, everything that you are putting on your Facebook page right now should be directing people to repentance, to salvation in Jesus Christ, to prayer. It should be lifting people up. It should be convicting the hearts. Everything else does not matter right now, my friends. Elijah understood that and he prayed and the people confessed and, and as that world had gone mad there at that time, he says, we're going to pray about the spiritual and we're not going to uh, just act like we're spiritual. A fervent prayer. Number four, we must have a fervent prayer. A prayer that is hot. A prayer that actually brings the will of God uh, to a prevailing boil, uh, an act of God. When you put on the stove top with water and you wait for that to boil up before you put the noodles or the rice in. We need to pray so hotly that it begins to boil at the top so that we can pour all the other elements uh, that we need in here. Go back to James chapter 5. Back to James in chapter 5 and, and look at the, the scripture here in verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. That was number 3. And pray one for another. See that? Pray for each other, not pray selfishly here. But it goes on here and it says that if we're going to pray for each other, that it's going to be effectual, fervent prayer. It's going to be the uh, continuous prevailing prayer of God's will, not our own, that does what? That in verse 16 it says uh, that this prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That it's going to availing means that it's going to do something. It's going to pray. It's going to make it boil up to the top. You're going to see it in action and then you're going to be able to add in the actions after that, I want you to see this evening that this prayer life, we've got to get ourselves into a hot prayer. Sometimes Christians pray selfishly, uh, but a prayer of faith is praying selflessly. It's not praying for what you want. It's praying for what God wills. Effectual. It is sustained, continual. God's will be done. Remember the Bible tells us in the model prayer 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray that prayer, what we're saying is we want that to be done all the time, Lord. We want your will to be done because you know better than we know. The Bible tells us, even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's a prayer of God's will. Hey, listen, I've said it many times that if God should come today in the form of the rapture and take up the Christians uh, with him today and the dead in Christ shall rise first, I, I would love to see my kids grow up and I would love to uh, grow one day and, and prayerfully have some grandkids and I would love to see my kids graduate and I'll say all those things and you may think that this sounds crazy, but I'd much rather see Jesus today than any of those things. My little girl said to me the other day, she's eight years old, and she said, Daddy, if the rapture comes, I'm never going to get to have any kids or be a homeschool mom of eight, but I won't care because I'll get to see Jesus. Out of the mouth of babes, wisdom is spoken. And I would say to you today that a hot prayer prays that God's will be done, that whatever God has for us, that that is what actually takes place. And that that is what we pray for. Look back in verse 37, back in 1 Kings chapter 18. And we'll remain in 1 Kings the rest of our time together this evening. 1 Kings chapter 18. Now, if you look in the 37th verse, we read this, but it says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Notice Elijah's not saying, Lord, save me from anything. Do this so that I look awesome. Do this so that people know that I'm a prophet, that they're talking about me in 2020. No, Elijah says this because Elijah understands that without God's will being done, that nothing's getting done anyway. And in verse 38, he goes on and he says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. So Elijah's fervent prayer now is, is so hot, hear me, O Lord, hear me, O Lord, that it bubbles up to the surface and then God adds everything else in, the contents, the noodles, the rice, and everything goes for it from there. Fervent prayer. A prayer of faith comes by, number five, acting. Acting. I'm going to read down from verse 40 on through the end of the verse here. Verses or chapter. In verse 40, And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundant rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, he's praying here, and put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. That is the number of God's completion, or completion in the Bible. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Listen, we've got to act. We've also got to act. In faithful prayer, a prayer of faith, once we've listened, we've shown the do things uh, as far as looking to him in faith to uh, get, to request. But I also believe the Bible shows us that we ought not forget what God has done and that we ought to go and act upon it. You see, the prayer of faith, and a, a real faithful prayer, in the time and season that we're in, my friends, I, I'm telling you today that the Lord God, His will is going to be done. You can't stop it, and you can't make it happen. But what you can do is, if you know that you can't stop it anyway, is go all in, get a board, and say, Lord, I'm with you, and I'm going to pray that your will be done. Now, how wise is it to pray against the God of the universe, the omnipotent God, the almighty God, who's going to get what he wants anyway? 
How wise is it? You know, I believe that the only thing that God does not do as far as uh, human beings, Christian and non-Christian, is he doesn't force us to do anything and he doesn't stop us from doing anything. Everything else God, the God of the universe, is in control of. As I look out my window and, and see the cardinals uh, laying, sitting on the back, the male and female, sitting on the back of the fence back there, God created those birds and, and they're there. and They're there because of God's will and his original creation, but they don't have a thought process like ours. They don't have a decision to make. They don't have to pray a faithful prayer because they have no soul. But human beings, we are God's most precious, we are God's most awesome creation, and God gave us a mind, he gave us an understanding of what we need to do in order to prevail, and he says, in order to do that, you must trust me, and when you say you trust God, you say that you're trusting that God knows better than you know. What Christians are often accused of, and rightfully so, is Christians get out in front of the Spirit, and what I mean by that is, Christians uh, make it sound good, they make it sound like it's godly, but truly it's their will and not God's will. I've seen much about loving your neighbor means to stay home, and I would agree with that to some point, but I would say that the first and great command is to love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with all thy might, with all thy mind. And so some people are on Facebook saying that, and they've not done the first part, so they have no business telling anybody else to love their neighbor, because you can't love your neighbor without loving God, because the Bible tells us God is love, and if you don't understand that, then you don't even understand the characteristic of love. See, I'm old school, and I like old school music, and I... I an old school R&B fan. And so as I grew up listening to those old Motown songs and listening to Earth, Wind, and Fire and listening to things that I don't uh, listen to as much anymore, but uh, the songs I know that are indwelt in my heart and I know some of these things that I know that love is an emotion. Smokey Robinson in the Miracle said, I second that emotion. And if you feel like loving, giving me a lifetime of devotion, I second that emotion. Hey! No, okay, I, I won't try to be like smoking tonight. But listen, I will say this to you. It's time for us Christians to give God a lifetime of devotion, truly. Out of pure love. Out of a heart that wants to see the will of God be done. Out of a selfless love for God. Out of a selfless love for people that wants to see better for them, esteeming others. Remember we had that as our verse of the quarter, esteeming others better than we esteem ourselves or more than we esteem ourselves, kind-hearted, tender. We are in a crazy time. But I will say this to you. God is still God. That has not, that will not change. A faith prayer is done in harmony with what God has revealed. I said at the beginning of this, I already know what's going to happen, and here's where I'm going with this. I know this. That the Bible says, to all those who believe that in the twinkling of an eye shall be changed forevermore, and that we will be with the Lord. And so, let's just have the chicken little syndrome that the sky is falling and let's just say that all this mass confusion and uh, media manipulation and all of the things that are going on with fear, let's just say that we are coming down and closing to the end of the world. Can I say this to you today? The rapture comes before the tribulation. So Christian, you have nothing to fear because either you are going to go by death or rapture one way or the other. What manner of death I die truly doesn't matter to me because when you're dead, you're just dead. But in the meantime, Jesus gives us something. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all these things shall be added unto you. If you want to have added faith, and you want to add to your virtue, you add faith. If you want to add to that, listen, you can't please God without faith, the Bible says. So in this crazy time, in times of peril, have enough faith to understand that the will of God is for the Christian to be in heaven with God and that you have nothing to worry about, nothing to be concerned about, no matter what happens here on this earth, that God's bigger than this earth. We know that this earth is going to go away. It's going to dissolve, dissolve like snow. It is going to melt with fervent heat. Now We live forever in heaven in the new Jerusalem that's prepared and built for us. This evening, I want you to have the prayer of faith when you're praying to God about this situation and others. Before you begin to pray, listen for the will of God. See what God is saying to you. And God has said to us, 
I've already taken care of this. I already know where you're going. And you trusted me and said you did too. You trusted me with your eternal life. Trust me with your temporal right now life. Show the world the power of God in this time. Don't you be afraid, Christian. Don't you be scared and run around with anxiety. You take heart. Now you can be wise and do the right things and obey the magistrates of this world, but don't do it in fear. Do it out of a faith practice that says, God, I know things are going to be okay, but I want to show the world how big you are in this time so that many would come to you and repent. Confess. I'm telling this to all people, but Christian, what I'm saying to you is confess the things in your life that ought not be there. Get them out of your life because God will not regard our prayer. He won't hear us from heaven if we regard iniquity in our heart. Number four, have a fervent prayer. Hot prayer. Know the will of God and then pray continually for that. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me, O Lord. Until that thing bubbles up. And number five, until you can act upon the prayer that God answered that he already told you was going to be answered before. This evening, if you bow your heads with me and close your eyes. As we close out, I never want to leave without giving opportunity for those who might be watching who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. If you're here tonight watching through Facebook and you're not saved, maybe you don't even understand what that means, I'm going to tell you right from the scriptures. To be saved is to be saved from death and hell. It's to be saved from eternal separation from God because your personal sins have separated you because God is so perfect and so holy and so right that he can't look upon wrong. And so if you're listening this evening, understand, number one, that God loves you and that it's not his will for you to be separated from him, but that he loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son not to condemn you, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved is a Bible word, not a Baptist word, not any denominational word. It is the Bible. It is God's word. Now, I want you to understand, if you're sitting there tonight and you say, I've made at least one mistake, Pastor Bryce, and I've done at least one thing. Maybe I'm still currently doing something wrong or currently in sin. Then the Bible says this, that you must repent. You must ask God to forgive you. But don't ask God for forgiveness in vain, saying, Lord, I want you to forgive me, and I'm going to keep on doing the same things over and over again. It doesn't work like that. You ask for forgiveness, and you stop where you're at, and you turn away from sin, and you start to live a life for God. It does not mean that you will live your life sinless for the rest of time, but it certainly means that you will sin a lot less. Number three in this, I need you to know that you've got to believe. You gotta believe with all of your heart and with all your soul that Jesus Christ truly is the only begotten Son of God, that He's God in flesh. He's not half man and half God, no, He's holy God, He's holy man. And that Jesus Christ came to the earth. He lived about 33 and a half years perfectly, sinlessly, never even having a bad thought. And then He died on the cross, crucifying your sins, burying it far away so that it would be gone forever, but that he didn't stay in the grave, that he rose up the third day and walked in a new life so that you can walk in a new life with him so that you don't have to dwell on the past, but you can walk forward with him in the spirit. And lastly today, if you say, Pastor, I don't know that if I died or if the rapture came that I would wake up in heaven, I would say to you, you don't know what's going to happen. But if you're a Christian, if you know that confidently in your heart, you don't have to think about tomorrow. You don't have to think about what if, because you already know the will of God is that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so if you don't know that today, I want to give you peace and comfort through the scripture. I can't save you. Only God can. And the way that God saves you is by your repentance, by you turning away from sin, and by you believing. If you're out there today, I just want you to pray only if you believe it in your heart and only if you truly want to repent and turn away from God and live holy and live sinlessly for God. If you truly want to be saved, you must confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus truly died to substitute your body for his. He took your body off the cross and replaced it with his own. He took the nails for you. He died for you. If you believe that this evening, and I simply want you right there where you're at just to ask the Lord into your heart. Say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and save my soul. I repent, Lord. I turn away from the wicked and I turn towards you. 
Help me to live for you a holy life. And help me now, Lord, to honor you in all things that I do, say, and think. In Jesus' name. Now, with everybody else's heads bowed and their eyes closed, Christian, a prayer of faith is a beautiful thing. We've been given what needs to happen for prayer of faith. Now I challenge you to pray in faith this way all the days of your life. Lord Jesus, I thank you for all those who have tuned in. I pray that you bless them. I pray that those who are watching from other churches, that you bless their churches. I pray that we all, Lord, would be Bible-believing, preaching Christians. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Now, if you are a member of ABC, you know we have been praying in 2020 uh, at 8.20 p.m., uh, 2020 military time, uh, for a couple or a few things. But I wanted to add in uh, that God would just heal our land. We've been praying for revival in that. If you're watching this and you're not a part of ABC, would you join us at 8.20 every night, 2020? 2020, uh, our church in February, we wanted to restart 2020 uh, with some things that have happened. Now we really want to restart 2020. Would you pray with us faithfully uh, that way? And then for the members of ABC, I want to remind you, again, you can send your tithes and offerings through uh, the mail. You can also do that online. If you absolutely must, you can drop that off at my, uh, my door. But we uh, want to continue to be faithful in that as we are uh, praying for our missionaries. We have missionary family stall cups in New York, uh, the epicenter of coronavirus here in America. We want to pray for that family. Uh, Brother Ron Taylor, uh, also a missionary there that we know, we want to pray for that family. And so if you would continue to pray faithfully for our nurses, we have nurses in our congregation, and medical assistants and people who are still working, uh, grocery store workers. Uh, we just want to pray for all of those folks. Uh, we have police officers, we have military personnel, we have correctional officers, uh, all these people, firefighters, uh, all in our congregation, factory workers, people that are putting together things so that we can have Lysol, we can have masks. I mean, all these people are still working. Would you pray a prayer of faith for them this evening as well? Continue that on. Hey, I love you. Awana kids, you can call me from 6.15 tonight up until 7.45 with your verses. Please call me with your section number and the page number. Uh, Miss Randy's been working overtime and she's a nurse, but I'll take those down myself and Miss Chandra, and we will uh, be certainly writing those down and having that stuff going. Awana goes on, right? Remember those verses. And also, I want to send, send a special shout out to my wife. Uh, she is helping record and set up and do all kinds of things in this crazy time. She's always very helpful to me, but even more so now. And this is also Pastor's Appreciation, uh, Pastor's Wife's Appreciation Month. And so uh, I will promise to do my very best to appreciate her here. But if you would send her a text or a card or just whatever it is, just to let her know or your pastor's wife, whoever your pastor is, let them know that you're thankful for them uh, because they truly are the backbone of our ministries. We can't do it without them. Uh, it's, it's the Lord uh, through the Holy Spirit and then our wives. And that is really how we're connected uh, through so many different ways, how pastors go forth. So please. Please, please uh, thank a pastor's wife today, and I just want to say God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. I'll be back live Wednesday night, live at 7 p.m., and then Thursday, I might do the first ever live thoughts for Thursday, and so you'll just have to wait and see what happens there, but I've got a couple of special guests on Thursday's thoughts for Thursday, so you'll want to tune in for that as well. God bless you, and I'll see you Wednesday night.